Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community, from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, good morning. How are you? I like it. Are y'all enjoying the cold weather? Y'all ready for summer? Yeah, I'm ready for summer. I'm going to be honest with you. This cold stuff is uh, getting old. I talked to a lady in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, I think this last week. I was doing an insurance claim and and I asked her how cold it was there. And she said, well, let me check. And she came back and said, it's, uh, it's going to be 10 degrees today. I said, would it make you feel any better if I told you the top is off my Jeep and I'm in shorts and sandals today? She's like, N anyway, no. Um, <laughs> and it all changed like the next day. I mean, you know, 40 degree swing, man, it was crazy. Um, man, it's good to be here this morning. We're working through this series called Growing Into Maturity. I learned very quick when I became a parent that children are masters at imitating their mama and daddy. Can I get an amen? amen? Yeah, if you've been a parent very long, you know that it doesn't take very long that the, these children will mimic everything that we do. You can smile at them in about three months and, and they'll smile back at you and, and they kind of just, they, they do what we do. In fact, I found some of these pictures this last week because I was thinking about this, that uh, children will imitate us um, or maybe... Maybe we imitate them. I don't know. This picture here, I love this one because it, when I was, before I became a dad, I, I would see pictures like that. I thought, man, this would be so cool when I have a kid. And, and, and so when we had a boy, we went and bought him one of those little bitty mowers like that. And I think he followed me once. And uh, it was like, okay, that was not as cool as I thought it would be. But then, then it, it became cool because when I, when I got my own yard, because I lived at Holly Lake Ranch, we didn't have to have a yard and we didn't take care of anything where I lived. And so I moved into town and I got my own yard and, and I had to say, I started mowing. And so I thought, man, yeah, it's gonna be cool. And then, I, then the idea came that maybe he will mow for me. Um, and so I remember the first time he came out there and he said, hey, dad, dad, dad. And he was following me with his little mower and he said, can I mow? And I'm like, well, yeah, let's, let's try that. And he made like one swipe. It's like, I'm done. And he's out of there. And, and very honestly, my OCD, anybody else OCD in here? Anybody? Because I actually enjoy mowing, okay? I know that sounds crazy, but I love to mow because it's one of the few things that I get to see finished. And uh, so I, I have a certain way I like to mow. Um, I don't think you... Well, I won't get into that. But anyway, it's kind of like vacuuming with lines. But anyway, um, I, I don't know that I could stand him to mow until he gets a little bit older because I just like it done a certain way. But uh, anyway, uh, got a couple more here. I, I was flipping through this week. Yeah, and then there's that one. Um, 
you know, as they get older, they imitate more than just a smile. They imitate more than just, you know, uh, those good things, and that's good and bad. But unfortunately, children don't discriminate very well on what they should imitate and what they shouldn't imitate. Amen? Uh, because they're just as likely to imitate a bad behavior as they are a good behavior. And you know that's true because if you've ever had your child repeat a word that you use, you know, it's, it's cute on some things and then all of a sudden they cuss. Right, because nobody in here cusses, right? And uh, so the first time that your child does that, it's like, that came from his mama, right? Yeah, you know, or that's from his dad, or who did it? I can't believe that. You know, we act so shocked because here's what we know is kids will imitate both good and bad, and sometimes they don't discriminate between them. That old adage that some parents will say, hey, do as I say, don't do as I do all of a sudden doesn't hold air because Dawson Trotman said years ago that more is caught than is taught. More is caught than is taught. And for many of us, we wanna just tell our kids, you do this because I said so. And in reality, what they're doing is they're gonna really follow your behavior more than they follow your directions. And let's don't be so hard on them because adults aren't that much different, are we? We don't follow directions very well, but we will follow behavior actions, words, beliefs. And what we'll do is we'll follow the culture or we'll follow an athlete or, or a musician or some successful leader and we will mimic them in their behavior. See, this whole idea of growing and maturity, if you look at the acrostic, I want you to show you this again because the very first week we talked about the D in disciple that we're growing into maturity. And that D involves dying to self. And that, that's that Hebrew idiom that means literally it's this idea of preference that we're going to prefer God's way over our flesh, over our way. And so if we're preferring God's way and we're dying to ourselves, then, then it just the natural progressing of what Jesus is talking about here is that we must imitate Jesus. We must imitate Jesus. And in John chapter 12, verses 49 and 50, we have Jesus given us this whole idea and this concept. In fact, let's read it together. Jesus is talking, for I have not spoken on my own. Again, death to self, now he He's talking about, if I don't speak on my own, then who do I speak? But the Father himself who sent me has given me a command as to what I should say and what I should speak. I know that his command is eternal life. So the things that I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. So Jesus is saying, as he, we're gonna see elsewhere, that listen, he makes, he imitates the Father. He does what the Father says, okay? Earlier in John, in John chapter five, verse 19, look what he says here, this is interesting. He says, therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, truly, truly, in other words, listen up, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things, the Son also does in like manner. And then you look in John 6, verse 38. Look at this one. He says, for I've come down from heaven, not to do my own will, death to self, not my own will, but the will of one who sent me. I am imitating the Father. John 14, 31 says, uh, he says, but so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly, everybody say exactly. I do exactly as the Father commanded me. So there's this idea that Jesus is not only introducing here in chapter 12, he's been talking about it from the very beginning of John, that listen, I imitate the Father, which gives us this, this command or this, this, um, this encouragement that if we're gonna be a disciple of Jesus, then we must imitate Jesus. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 4, 16, strongly stated, therefore I urge you, imitate me. In chapter 11, verse one, he repeats it, imitate me. Why? Just as I also imitate Christ. Listen, in, imitation and conformity are facts of life. We are going to imitate someone. By the way, everybody in this room is imitating someone or something. So let me make this statement. Being a disciple means being an imitator. Let me say that again, maybe you didn't get it. Being a disciple means being an imitator. Just in case you missed it, let me say it one more time. You ready for this? Being a disciple means being an imitator because men are naturally imitated beings. Those who we most admire, who we trust, who we associate with has an effect on our character. One of my mentors used to tell me, it is a fact, you'll become like those you spend the majority of your time with. That means you four sitting right here on the 
second row. You hang out with each other enough, you're going to start acting like each other. In fact, I could probably pick up just about 10 minutes with you guys. You're probably already acting like each other, probably already saying the same things as each other because the fact you'll become like those you spend the majority of your time with. You laugh the same, you, you walk the same, you dress the same, you have the same hairdo. Could I go on? It's a fact, we become like those we spend the majority of our time with. And listen, I'm not being hard on them. I look around this room here. We are naturally imitative beings. That's why the apostle Paul says to become imitators of him. Why? Because he's imitating Christ. And by the way, someone in this room is imitating you. Think about that. Someone in this room is imitating you. And that's why it's important that you and I begin to ask the question, who are we imitating? Because you're imitating someone or something, a culture, a set of beliefs, a value system. And someone's watching you. You see, Jesus Christ is the only one who ever lived a sinless, perfect life. He lived in perfect dependence on the Father, always obedient to his will. And first and foremost, you gotta know Jesus if you're gonna imitate him. You gotta know him as Savior and Lord. You remember a couple of weeks ago that we, we said in our statements that, that we believe that Jesus Christ is the one we follow. Put that up on the screen, guys. That Jesus Christ is the ones we follow. That unapologetically, we are followers of Jesus. We're not Baptist, we're not Methodist, we're not Presbyterian, we're not Church of Christ, we're not interdenominational, I'm not sure what that is. We're not non-denominational, we are followers of Jesus Christ. And that means he is both Christ and Lord. In Christ Christ, he's our Messiah, he's our Savior, he's our Deliverer, it's where we're fully loved, we're fully forgiven, and everybody loves that, but on the flip side of that, he's also our Lord, and the Lordship of Christ is what changes or transforms our life, because he is our Master, he's our King, he is our Ruler, and so in everything that we do, if we're going to be imitators of the one who saved us, our Savior, our Deliverer, our Messiah, then we must imitate everything he did and do what he said. To be a growing disciple is, means we're gonna be an imitator of Jesus. In fact, D.A. Carson says this, if you bow to the Lordship of Jesus, you're required to bow to Jesus' view of everything. If he is our Lord and we bow to him as Lord, then therefore there should be a transformation that takes place in every one of us who've been walking with God for any amount of time, whether it's been a month or it's been 30 years, there should be a transformation of the way we see the world and the way we see the world should be the way Jesus sees the world and the way Jesus sees the Father. It starts with Jesus as an example that he was mimicking or imitating the Father. Being a disciple means being an imitator. Jesus demonstrated what that meant. In fact, when Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, chapter, or chapter 11, verse 1, he said, and you should follow me, that word follow literally is the word, we get the word mimic or mime. That I'm going to mimic everything Jesus did. I'm going to mime everything Jesus did. Whatever Jesus does, I do. Whatever Jesus thinks, I think. Whatever Jesus loves, I love. So there's this idea of being a disciple means being an imitator. Being a disciple means being an imitator. That's why Paul said, imitate me. It's, a, it's the purest, most simplest form of discipleship. You wanna grow in maturity and you must imitate Jesus because he's our savior, but he's also our Lord, our master. And by the way, someone's following you. The question is, are you following Jesus? In fact, if I just took a week, Jerry, and said, I'm going to give you Uriah, and Uriah is going to go everywhere with you this whole week, and everything you do, everything you look at, everything you say, everything you eat, everything for a whole week, wherever you sleep, he's going to be right there. Getting creepy. <laughs> what would he walk away with? And I'm not picking on Jerry and Uriah. I, I could point out any, John, I could point out anybody in this room, Royce, any of us. If someone lived with you for a solid week, what would they look like? What would they sound like? Hello. The question is, are you following Jesus? See, discipleship is growth through imitation. Being a disciple means being an imitator. How many of you guys know how to lay bricks? Anybody? Anybody a bricklayer in here? Anybody know how? Go ahead, raise your hand. Anybody? 
maybe one, okay, two. I remember 13, 14 years ago, I didn't know how to do that. And I, I, we went on our first mission trip to Haiti. And our, our um, mission leader told us, he said, listen, when we go there, we're going to do construction, but we're not going to do it the American way because we're not superior. We don't have a better way. We're going to serve the Haitians. And so you're going to do what the Haitians do. And in Haiti, do what the Haitians do. And so you're going to go down there. They're going to teach you how to do this. And you're going to do exactly what they do. So we went down there. And I remember the first day I'd never worked with cinder blocks or never worked with mortar or anything like that. And, and I remember that Haitian taught us how to make mortar and taught us how to put the mortar on the brick and lay the bricks. And, and after about an hour of watching him, about 30 minutes of watching him, we were all of a sudden doing it ourselves. And if we got to a point where we didn't know what to do, we would just go over and we would watch him. And then we would come back and we would imitate exactly what he was doing. We learned how to make concrete and we learned how to build houses. And I remember the end of that week, we came home and it was like, dude, I could build a house in my backyard. Went back another time and they taught us how to, how to tie up rebarb and, and there's a certain way you do that wire and you spin it real fast and you bend it over and all that. I'd never done that. And, and so we would watch the Haitian and then we would do it. And if we were doing it wrong, the Haitian, no, 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 no. And he'd teach us to do it again. And so we learn through imitation. See, discipleship in its purest form is you and I simply watching what Jesus did and do it. What if we started following and acting like the one we profess as our Savior and Lord? What if we began to love like Jesus loved, forgive like Jesus forgave? What would change? You see, Jesus lived in perfect dependence on the Father, always obedient to his will, always. And this just didn't start when he turned 30. This was who he was. In fact, if you have your Bibles, turn over to Luke chapter two because we get this glimpse into Jesus' journey of when he was a child. And we don't have a whole lot before he turned 30, but after 30, we have just volumes of books on him. But we get this one glimpse in Luke's book uh, as he writes about Jesus and Mary and Joseph as they, they're going back to live. Let's read it together in Luke 2, verses 39 to 52. It's not gonna be on the screen, but if you got your Bibles, you can read along or listen to me. He says, when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, talking about Mary and Joseph, they returned to Galilee to their own city of Nazareth. The child, talking about Jesus, he was a baby here in verse 40. The child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And so they, they had Jesus, remember they had to go from Nazareth to, to, to register, and, and then after they registered and they did everything according to the law, then they went back to their hometown of Nazareth. And, and here we have Jesus growing up. And in verse 40 to 41, Jesus has grown 12 years. And so we get this glimpse where God just kind of opens up and says, let me give you a glimpse of who my son is. And so in verse 41, it says, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of Passover. And when he, talking about Jesus, became 12, they went up there according to the custom of the feast. And as they were returning after spending the full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents were unaware of it and supposed him to be in the caravan because they traveled in caravans then. They didn't get on their camel and just in their station wagon and go as a family. They all went together in these big caravans. And so they're assuming that Jesus is somewhere in the caravan, uh, but supposed him to be in the caravan and went a day's journey. And they began looking for him among the relatives and acquaintances. When they did not find him in verse 45, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Then after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he said to them, why is it that you're looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? But they didn't understand the statement which he had made to them. And he went down to them. And went down with them and came to Nazareth and he continued in subjection to them and his mother treasured all these things in her heart. In verse 52, and Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and statue and in favor with God and man. Now listen, I wanna point out some things in here, but I, I, I wanna point out something to you before we get to what we should be imitating in Jesus because the one we're called to imitate is there's something unique about him. He is the blameless sinless, perfect son of God. He's not a son of God. He wasn't a man at one point who became a God who came back as a man. He is the perfect, sinless son of God, fully God, fully man. Jesus, whom we should imitate, is perfect. 
And that's who we imitate. We're imitating one that was both fully God and fully human. Have you ever just thought about Joseph and Mary's issues? Think about this. What would it be like to raise a perfect child? I know what some of you are thinking. I'd take it in a heartbeat, right? I mean, think about this. It must have been a difficult role. I remember somebody told me about parenting. You know, parenting's easy until your kids get an opinion, right? And then when their opinion or reasoning makes more sense than your opinion or reasoning, you're in trouble. That's when you just say, do as I say, not as I do, right? Right. See, Joseph and Mary didn't have the gospel accounts to read when they were raising Jesus. They, they were doing the best they could with a perfect child, one who came from God. As they were going up to this feast 80 miles away in Jerusalem, it was Joseph and Mary's custom that they would go up there. And we're, we're not sure that this was the first time Jesus went. This is the first time the scripture actually indicates that he's there. And Joseph and Mary stayed there for the whole week. And then they started back. And, 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 and when they started back, they just probably assumed Jesus is there. Because, I mean, granted, he's a perfect kid. They shouldn't have to tell him to get in the caravan, right? I mean, he's always done exactly what they told him to do. He's always been exactly where they told him to be. So it wasn't like they were walking along going, well, I wonder if Jesus is gonna be obedient. No, they just assumed he was, he was perfect. And they, yeah, he's probably with Joseph, oh, he's probably with Mary, oh, he's probably with the ox. And then they get there that night and they find out Jesus is not there and they have to travel all the way back. And they find him in the temple and he's teaching 12. Don't miss that. He's in the temple, he's teaching and then Mary comes up to him and she's emotional, wouldn't you? Not if you just lost a child, but the perfect child. You've now lost God. Yeah. I mean, hello? You wouldn't tweet that, amen? You sure wouldn't be on Facebook about that. Lost God. Anybody seen him? You know. She goes to him and says, listen, don't you understand what you've done to me and your dad? We've been anxiously looking for you. And Jesus responded, don't miss this because it's so big about who Jesus says he is. He says, why is it that you're looking for me? And listen to this. Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? <laughs> Here we see Jesus just very uniquely setting himself apart as if he wasn't already to say, I am the unique son of God and I'm gonna do my father's will. And even though I'm human, even though I've grown up to this point, I have a father that I come from that outweighs anything on this earth, that outweighs anything there. Physically, he grew. Intellectually and spiritually, he grew. And God's grace was on him. And then in verse 51, we see where the rest of his life until we saw his public ministry was described says, then he went down with them. In other words, he left Jerusalem and he came back to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother kept all these things in her heart and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with people. Now you may be sitting here listening to me going, okay, if he's perfect, then why did he need to grow? You ever wondered that? I mean, if Jesus was perfect, right? Sinless, then what did he need to grow in? I know, it's kind of weird, isn't it? I was, I was pondering that this week. He's perfect. Why does he need to grow? I was doing some study on this in the gospel according to St. Luke by Plummer. He, he says this. He said at each stage, he, talking about Jesus, was perfect for that stage. But the perfection of a child is inferior to the perfection of a man. It is the difference between perfect innocence and perfect holiness. See, in his humanity, Jesus still submitted to his parents. He was still growing in his humanity, but through his deity, he knew all things. He was fully God and fully man. In his humanity, he had to grow in godly wisdom and in understanding and in his divine calling and mission. He was growing as a child, but he was still growing. He was fully, truly God, but he was still growing up. And Jesus looked at him. And they said, we're looking for you, son. And he just simply draws a gentle but distinct line between Joseph as his earthly father and God as his true father. That he is fully God, 
that the latter relationship has priority over the earthly relationship, which is our example of death to self, that our heavenly relationship has priority over any earthly relationship. And that's why we should be imitators of Jesus, imitators of our Savior, to imitate no one other than the unique Son of God who was perfect, who came and lived a perfect sinless life for us, died on a cross and three days later rose again. Why? For us, for our forgiveness, for our reconciliation to God. And therefore we should imitate Christ. You see, Jesus grew in spiritual growth. It's a mystery in all that Jesus was fully God, yet a man, he had to grow spiritually. The scripture says that he increased in wisdom between birth and age 12, made more progress between 12 and the time he turned 30, that Jesus was growing in wisdom. That word wisdom in the Hebrew language literally means a skill, that Jesus grew his skills in growing in wisdom and in training. That he grew up, he had, a, he had a part of actively engaging in the process. See, just because you're here on Sunday morning, just because you're listening to Christian music, doesn't mean you're growing. There is an active skill training developing process in us that we should be engaging in the process of spiritual growth. Jesus did. It said he grew in spirit and, and truth. Between the ages, that wisdom and truth, and it said that God was on him. You see, spiritual growth takes time. It's not something you just arrive at and check the box. I'm still very much a work in progress. You're a very much work in progress because it takes time to engage in the process. It's a lifelong, it's not automatic. The question we should be asking, what am I doing to grow in the things of God? In fact, if you're still doing the same things you did 10 years ago, you might have to ask questions. question, I'm not growing. I'm not growing. See, healthy things grow and it takes time for those things to grow. Are you spending time in his word? Are you reading solid books that instruct you in the faith? Are you spending time in spiritual discussions? Are you, are you sharpening your wisdom and understanding? You see, spiritual growth involves an active interest in the word of God. If we're gonna imitate Jesus, then guess what? We've gotta know the word that talks about Jesus. We've gotta know the word. I mean, think of all the interesting things. Here's Jesus coming from Podunk, Nazareth, coming to the big city. It's like going from Hawkins to Austin, amen? amen. Country. I remember the first time I took my kids when they, when they started realizing we lived in Holly Lake Ranch for almost nine years and, and there's like no street lights back there. And so we usually, you know, when babies, we got them home, put them in bed and all that. I remember the first time we were driving through Longview or Tyler, it was one of them. And, and our kids were like, <gasps> and we were like, what, what? Dad, look at those buildings. They'd never seen buildings lit up. We're like, oh, we're terrible parents. We gotta get them out more, you know? Jesus is coming from Nazareth to Jerusalem. Think about all the things he could have been involved in. You're right? You know what happens when you take a little boy to the football game on Friday night? You know what they want to do? They want to go out behind the stadium and play football with their friends, right? And think about what Jesus could have been doing. He's 12 years old. He's, he's there in the, he's down in the big city, man. It's a wall city of Jerusalem. I mean, there's, they were probably reenacting the wars from Jericho and, and they're probably going, Jesus, come on, Jesus. No, no, no. Think about where Jesus was. He was in the temple. He was in the temple. His parents found him there with the teachers listening, asking intelligent questions, giving answers that displayed unusual understanding. Listen, if you wanna grow into things of God, like Jesus, you must have a thirst for spiritual truth, not sound bites, not Twitter bites, but to dig into the word of God. If nothing else, the red letters alone, if we did what Jesus talked about in the red letters, to imitate him, you see, spiritual growth is focused in two directions, towards God and others. There's a vertical and there's a horizontal. Jesus wrapped it up in the two greatest commands. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. That's the vertical. And he said, the second is like the first, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, listen, if we're gonna imitate God, then it's gonna change the way we love our neighbor. It's gonna change because the vertical is gonna affect the horizontal. We should imitate Jesus, the Son of God, in spiritual growth, but we also should imitate Jesus, the Son of God. Listen to me, this is gonna be exciting. In routine faithfulness. 
How many of you guys like routine? Come on, be honest. I, I'm a routine guy, okay? I like getting up every morning at about 4.45 to five o'clock. I go to bed about eight, 8.15. Can I get an amen? Yeah, all right? You get me off my routine, it messes me up. Saturdays mess me up. Because on Saturdays, you're supposed to sleep late, right? So I wake up at 4.45 and I stare at the clock. I'm thinking, I, I don't need, I can't get up, right? I can't because it's Saturday and I don't have to. And so I sleep late. And at 5.15, I get up. Amen? Just messes with me. There's something about routine that brings stability though. See, the time in the temple interacting on the things of God with these teachers was undoubtedly the high point of Jesus' life. Can you imagine? He knows he's God. He knows he's the son of God. He's been living in a carpenter's house, doing chores, doing all those things that every kid should do. Yes, I said every kid should be doing chores, amen? Yeah, kids said, oh me. And at 12 years old, he goes into the temple. Can you imagine his heart? He, I, this is what I was built. This is what I was designed to do. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. And after Mary and Joseph found him and they pulled him out of the temple, in verse 51 of Luke chapter two, it says, he went down with them. In other words, he left the temple and left Jerusalem and came to Nazareth and continued in obedience to them. Now think about this. What a letdown that must have been. Doing what he's designed to do and then having to go back and do chores. The scripture says we don't see another glimpse of Jesus for 12 years or until he's 30. Jesus was doing chores, gathering water, going to feast, doing what every good Jewish boy did. And, and notice Mary and Joseph, because this is, this is what's huge. There was a routine faithfulness in them. And see, some of us don't like routine because we're always seeking something exciting. Listen, the most exciting thing you can possibly do in this room, if you're gonna imitate Jesus, is develop the routine of Jesus. His parents in verse 22 of chapter two says they were obedient to the law of Moses. They dedicated Jesus in observing the purification laws. They didn't have to, he's the son of God, but they were faithful in their routine. In verse 39 states how they performed everything according to the law of the Lord. In verse 41, it mentioned their custom of going to the feast of the Passover every year. This couple lived quietly in routine faithfulness, teaching their children, teaching Jesus what it means to be faithful. I'm gonna tell you what this would look like in modern day. If you had a son like Jesus, here's what we would have said today. Man, Jesus is gonna be successful. Did you see that? Did you see how the rabbis were amazed in his answers? Oh my gosh, then we gotta enroll him in advanced courses right now. We've gotta push him. Monday night, there's one in Lindell. Tuesday night, there's one in, in Longview. A oh, Wednesday night, I know it's church night, but I'm telling you, he's gonna be chosen by the rabbis. We gotta get him in that class, man. Oh, oh my gosh, did you hear about that school? We are selling everything and we're moving to Dallas because we're gonna get our kid noticed. Too close? Got quiet. Instead, notice this. They took him back to Nazareth and they modeled for him routine faithfulness in the things of God. Listen, one of the chief concerns that all parents should have is the welfare of their children's souls, not their athletic success, not necessarily their academic success. Our number one goal as Christian, God-following, Jesus-imitating people is our child's soul. I know that's not popular. Your kids need to see you reading the Bible, praying, being at church on regular attendance, honest, being kind to people, being kind to each other. No. Being concerned for the lost. To imitate Jesus and Joseph and Mary in just routine faithfulness. Being faithful in those little things that you think doesn't matter, but by the way, your kids are watching you. This is a call to parents in this room. 
There's a routine faithfulness and growing to be like Jesus. And here's the third thing. We should grow like he grew in spiritual growth. Routine faithfulness. And lastly, commitment to God's purposes. Even at the age of 12, Jesus was clear on the priority of his commitment. In verse 49, when his parents confronted him, here's what he said. Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? This is what I'm made for. This is who I am. He sets the priority of his commitment to his heavenly father above all others. Then I don't have an opinion. I'm doing what my father said. It's necessary. The word shows that Jesus didn't come to do his own will, but the will of the father who sent him. And even so, if Jesus has redeemed us, listen to me, we are not our own. That's why we must deny ourselves death to self and begin to imitate Jesus, that we were saved for a purpose. You are redeemed for a purpose, that God has a plan and a purpose for your life, and you do not have to miss it. And listen, if you don't have a sense of mission, one of two things is happening in your journey right now. If you're kind of lost and you're going, I don't know why I'm here, and I don't know what's going on, can I just be honest with you? You're probably living for yourself. You're probably living for yourself. You need to go back to step one, deny self. Deny self. That could be one thing that's going on. The other thing could be going on, you may just be healing. And you know what? We want you to heal. This is a safe place. Because sometimes when you need to heal, you need to come off mission for a little season to heal. But listen, that doesn't mean you stay there. Because we want you to heal and get back on mission. See, we should imitate Jesus in our unswerving commitment to God's purpose above all else. In John chapter 12, verse 50, Jesus laid it out. Listen to what he said. He goes, I know that his command is eternal life. Listen, Jesus just starts off and says, listen to me. The reason I'm here is so you can have eternal life. Do you? Can you honestly answer that question? Do you have eternal life? Yeah, I'm asking you that this morning. Has there ever been a time in your life where you realize your sin separates you from God. You know, that's why Jesus came. It's because our sin separates us from him. And Jesus came to bridge that gap to forgive us of our sins, took our sin upon him and died on a cross and three days later rose again, that if you and I will put our faith and trust in him and repent of our sins and confess him as Lord of our life, he says, I'll save you. Have you ever done that? See, that's why Jesus existed. That's why he came, is for eternal life. You see, being a disciple means being an imitator. I mean, let me say that again, because maybe you missed it. Maybe you hadn't heard it today. Being a disciple means being an imitator of Jesus. Would you say that with me? Being a disciple means being an imitator of Jesus. Being a disciple means being an imitator of Jesus. There's an old Irish legend that tells of a king who disguised himself in his kingdom. And he went to one of his barons' castles. And he came in and nobody recognized him. And so they say, seated him at this lowest table. And as he began to have conversations, some of the nobles heard this guy and said, man, this guy's sharp. This guy's smart. So they invited him to the next table up. And again, they started listening to his language and, and they didn't recognize him as the king. They just said, man, this guy is really sharp. So they elevated him until he was elevated all the way to the main table. And after a display of great wisdom, one of the lords spoke out and said, in truth, sir, you speak like a king. If you're not a king, you deserve to be. It says, then the king removed his disguise and took his rightful place among his subjects. You see, I just wonder what people hear when they hear us. Do they hear us or do they hear a king? Do they hear the king? Do they hear Jesus? If you closed your eyes, would you recognize the voice of Jesus? You see, the men and women in Jesus, they missed him. Right there in the flesh, yes, God blinded them but they missed him. And I just wonder in this room for us, when people hear our language, they see our behavior. Do they see a king? Do they see Jesus? A 
If he's your savior, imitate him. If you imitate him, then guess what? You're going to sound like him. You're going to begin to look like him. You're going to be able to love like him. And you're going to quit living for yourself. Listen, these are not easy words. These are hard words. Growing into maturity means we deny ourselves and we become imitators of Jesus Christ. Amen or oh me? Let me pray for you. Father, I love you. And God, I realize in this room this morning, there's, there's some folks very possibly that has never given their life to you. God, the reason you came is for eternal life. You didn't come to make us rich. You didn't come to make us happy. You didn't come to make us comfortable. You came to save us, to rescue us. And so, God, if there's somebody here this morning that they've never surrendered their life to you, they've never repented and confessed you as Lord, then, God, I pray that right now in this moment that, God, you would give them the courage and the ability to confess their sins, to repent of their sins, and invite you to be the Lord of their life right now where they sit. Give them courage. You said if we confess with our mouth that you are Lord and believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, Father, you said you would save us. So God, I pray that there would be someone here this morning that gets saved. And God, for the rest of us in this room that maybe already have a relationship with you. God, I pray that this week you would give us courage to imitate you. If nothing less, just, just the red letters. Just, just to do what you did, to love God and love people. That God, we would love you and we would love each other. And God, that slowly but surely over time, as we grow into maturity, the more we imitate you, the more we sound like you, act like you, and look like you. So God, give us courage to step out of this room today and become little Jesuses all over this community. Not in a weird way. The people that were attracted to you, Jesus, were whores and prostitutes and drunks and thieves. They didn't have a problem with you. And God, most people today don't have a problem with you. They have a problem with the church because we don't love like you and look like you. So God, let us be little Jesuses in this community that we are imitating Jesus, the Lord and the Christ. Help us. I love you. I pray over my friends, my family this morning, Lord, and in the name of Jesus, as we walk out of this place, there'd be healing, there'd be blessing, there'd be favor. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray, and everybody said, amen. Hey, I love you. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, we would love to know. Uh, maybe you came with somebody, tell them. Otherwise, I'll see you next week. Have a great week. I love you. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.